With M-theory, you have an 11-dimensional space. I've heard you talking about the fact that there were um, a certain number of cycles. 84. Out of these 21, 10 are almost non-physical. The remaining 11 are somewhat mildly physical. If you look into this piece of creation, the whole creation is present in a footprint form. Looking at the footprint, I know where it is going. And then the point I made was that even physics itself claims that there are higher dimensions. Because Newton had a three-dimensional space, Einstein said there was four-dimensional space, space and time being merged, which of course agrees with what you were saying earlier, that space and time are basically the same. And then I explained how they introduced the fifth dimension to explain electromagnetism, and then how they introduced six more dimensions in order to, in superstring theory, in order to ex ex describe all the physical interactions. So then you had a ten-dimensional world. And then finally I said with M-theory, we had the idea there was another dimension, so you have an eleven-dimensional space. And Sadhguru made the fascinating remark, which was new to me, that actually eleven dimensions is precisely what arises in some of the the traditions. Maybe we can come back to that. We started off talking about uh, the cycles of the universe. And, and I, there was something which intrigued me. I, I, in one of your films, or, or one of the interviews, I've heard you talking about the fact that there were um, a certain number of cycles. 84. 84, exactly. But I'm fascinated where does the figure 84 come from and why 84? See, uh, there is a continuous talk about Big Bang. Yeah. I was talking to one of the scientists who's written a book on Endless Universe. Yes, Endless Universe, that's the title of the book. Paul, Paul Steinhardt. Yes. Then I asked him a simple question. Is it possible there could have been many banks? He did like that and then he said, possible. Then I said, if there are many banks, see if you have an automobile, if you take off the manifold, you will see the engine will go bang, 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 bang. If you throttle up, it'll roar. So I said, if there was a series of banks, could it have been a roar? He said, why not? Possibly. I said, we've always been saying it's a roar. So we called the first form as the Rudra. Rudra means the one who roars. He roared. Like this, then we evolved many forms to describe this. This was Kala, this was Mahakala, this was Kala, this was Rudra. This is the first form. And then the many forms, how they came, there are various aspects to it. So these eighty-four, out of these eighty-four, many have dissolved. Their bare, vague footprint is there, but they have dissolved. But the footprint is there in this. Twenty-one of them have a little larger footprint. Oh. Out of these twenty-one, ten are almost non-physical. So non-physical, let's say. The remaining eleven are somewhat mildly physical. But the last four are reasonably physical. So, we see this number twenty-one as an important process, whatever we want to do, we do it in twenty-one minutes, in twenty-one ways and all this, because these twenty-one still have a footprint. If you want to rise beyond your physicality, absolutely, you have to rise beyond all the twenty-one. But you don't have to bother about those things, because if you rise above the physical nature, not just in terms of physical body, but even the Information is physical, all information that you carry, which makes you you, whether dead or alive, it still makes you you, that one, we want to rise beyond that. So that imprint carries all this, and out of the eighty-four, twenty-one are still manifest in different levels of, for lack of words, I'm saying transience, from almost non-existent, others below twenty-one, they're 
completely gone. But their footprint is still there, they don't have any influence or impact, their qualities are not imprinted in us. But these twenty-one qualities are there in us. How many more will happen? One hundred and twelve will happen. Hundred and twelve? One hundred and twelve. Each one of them may take whatever they… they've calculated these yojanas up to how long it'll take, that's not… my number game is not my game. So, hundred and twelve times it'll happen. After that, it will manifest in a way that it's non-physical and becomes a perpetual universe. A non-physical universe will manifest itself, that it doesn't need physical matter but exists. And even individual existence may happen, we don't know. It may happen or one massive happening may happen, but a proper manifestation of universe without physicality. When that happens, that is the final one. All I am saying is, this simple thing that I am talking about, if I give you the footprints as to how this has evolved, if you can create a mathematical backbone to it, I think it'll make sense to lots of people and you will be seeing further, not with physical eyes, but mathematically you will be seeing much further than where you are seeing right now. That's fascinating because that is not one of the standard modern cosmological theories, you see. So, but what you're saying is that you've got these cycles which at some stage evolve beyond the straightforward physical. The beautiful thing is, they're clearly defining this. It is all… see, because the Indian cosmology is built and personified in a certain way. Most people, Indian origin people will know this. There is a coiled up snake upon which a god is lying down. That call… that snake is called Shesha. Shesha means when we are learning mathematics in Indian languages, the reminder… what do you call it? Remainder. Remainder is called Shesha. What is remaining is Shesha. Even in our common language, we use that. Shesha means something left over. So, this… this snake is the Shesha upon which once again creation begins. So this shesha leftover, the leftovers are there from last twenty-one universes. But the imprint of the leftover is diminishing as you go backwards and increasing as you come forwards. But the last four are significant. And so was consciousness in only some of these no, 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 all of them were conscious, fully manifest universes. All of them were... But they ran out of time, that what was Kala became Mahakala, but it left footprints. In some footprints they're very strong, we can see exact nature of what they are. Some footprints are very weak, that we can barely see that they are there. And is this evolution towards, after 112 cycles, a non-physical state, does that correspond to a, a sort of a, a evolution of consciousness? In a way, it is like consciousness graduating, that without physical form it can manifest itself. These things are not today, these things have been spoken millennia ago. How do they know all this? The simple thing is like this, if you look into this piece of creation, the whole creation is present in a footprint form. By looking at my footprint, suppose I walk through the garden, you, by looking at my footprint, you can measure my weight, my height, my gait. You can even guess how smart am I. Depending on how I navigate through spaces, you can see how smart you are. So in many ways, various aspects of this creation, you will never be able to see this through physical approach or even mental approach because mind we see it as a physical projection. Mind is a little subtler projection of the mind, of the body. So these things cannot be seen but the footprint can be seen. With the footprint, you can know most of the things. Only thing you cannot know is, what is my nature, you cannot know. But you can figure out, if I walk through, let's say a difficult terrain, you can easily figure out how smart I am. You can figure out what is my thinking. People do this. 
Looking at the animal footprints, I do this myself. Looking at the footprint, I know where it is going, is it hungry, is it not hungry, is it hunting, is it just walking around? I... I have survived in the jungles because I see these things very clearly. So, looking at the footprint of creation, if you have a lot of these numbers, which I don't have no numbers in my head, only number I have is this one. <laughs> or sometimes it becomes like this. I don't have any other numbers. Because of that, I don't bother about that. But if you have all these numbers, if I show you the footprint, can you build a mathematical ladder to that? If you build that, we can say scientists are seeing something that their eyes or their telescopes cannot see.